Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, your trusted source for insights on property investment, success and money matters. In today's show, I want to tackle a question that's looming at large in many conversations at the moment. Should you be fearful or should you be greedy about entering the Australian property markets right now? With Australian property markets showing signs of both opportunities, but also risks, it's a challenging landscape to navigate for both seasons and investors, and especially for newcomers. These contradictory sentiments arise because of a number of factors. The market fluctuations, very fragmented markets. We're worried about what's going to happen to interest rates. More and more of us are worried about the government interference. Leave us property investors alone, Mr. Government. We're worried about socioeconomic conditions and many other things. And that means that the balance between fear and greed for some people can be a fine line to walk and understanding the current property climate is vital if you want to make informed decisions about investment. Now, if you're a regular listener to the show, you'll know I usually have guests on, but today it's going to be just me and you, you and me, as I share my thoughts and help you interpret the current market indicators and maybe we can spot some potential opportunities amongst this perceived chaos. Whether you're an experienced investor, a first-time buyer, or merely an observer of the Australian property market, I hope to provide you with a balanced perspective and some useful insights that could guide your decision-making process. So, let's unpack the question, is it time to be fearful or greedy in our property markets? Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success property investment and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's authority in wealth creation through property, who has been voted one of Australia's top 50 most influential thought leaders. What should you be doing in these, let's call them interesting property times we're experiencing. Is it time to be fearful or is it the right time to be greedy? Now, I know many investors are confused with the many mixed messages the media and many of the commentators are delivering. On the one hand, the property markets bottomed earlier this year and in many locations, property values have increased for quite a number of months now. On the other hand, the media keeps reminding us that inflation is remaining stubbornly high, interest rates could rise again and there could even be a recession lurking around the corner. So I've noticed two types of emotions in those people who are interested in property. With a continual car conveyor belt of negative messages, phobia is prevalent. You know, fear of buying too early. Some home buyers and investors, they're, they're trying to time the market, wondering what if prices actually fall a little bit further? Maybe there is going to be that interest rate cliff, the fixed rate cliff. What if rising interest rates cause a recession? And then there's the other camp. Those experiencing FOMO, fear of missing out. I'm actually seeing some investors and some home buyers already concerned they're being left behind, recognizing that they've missed the bottom of the market. As I said, these are two very powerful emotions, and it's not unusual. Fear and greed have always driven investment markets. In fact, the master investor Warren Buffett said, I'll tell you how to become rich. Be fearful when others are greedy, and be greedy when others are fearful. So today, I'd like to give you my thoughts on this, and maybe we'll start with a lesson in history. 30, 33 years ago, as we were working through the recession we had to have, few would have thought property would be a good investment. It was 1993, and interest rates had come down 3% over the previous two years as the Reserve Bank tried to stimulate the economy and our faltering property markets. Oh, by the way, this brought interest rates down to 10%, the lowest level had been for 13 years, 10%. Having just experienced Australia's first recession in a long, long time, consumers and business confidence was very, very low. There are too many properties on the market, buyers were scarce, and some properties, particularly the top end, the more expensive properties, plummeted in value. Now, I remember a few years earlier, there was this Black Monday in October 1987 when the stock market collapsed. It was unprecedented. It was started off in Wall Street. There was a huge drop in Wall Street and the effects reverberated around the world. 
Actually, I remember the day really well. I was in on holidays in Sydney with with some friends, uh, and I actually didn't have any uh, shares in the stock market. But my friend Michael, at the, who was there and with me at the time, really panicked because when he heard the news. He saw the value of his share portfolio plummeting, but I didn't at the time fully appreciate the severity of the consequences from that Black Monday in October 1987. So while the stock market eventually recovered, in America, the lumbering savings and loans industry in the United States, which financed a lot of homes, that was beginning to collapse, leading to property funding crisis that put the financial well-being of millions of Americans in jeopardy. Now, that was over the other side of the world, and I thought, oh, that's over there. It's not going to affect us. But in turn, the financial contagion spread to other sectors of the financial markets and led to a recession that hit countries whose economies were previously healthy, but they were economically closely linked with the United States, and that included Canada, the United Kingdom, and yes, us here in Australia. So what was happening in Australia back then? Well, to buy a typical house in mid-1993 back then, you would have had to pay around $173,000 in Sydney. In Melbourne, houses were cheaper, $138,000. In Brisbane, one hundred and twenty-one was the median house price, 102000 in Perth. Interestingly, Perth was quite expensive at the time, 156000 in Canberra, 110000 for a median house in Adelaide. Hobart was cheap. It was the cheapest city, $96,000 to buy a house there, and 132000 in Darwin, almost the same price as a median house in Melbourne. But anyway, that was three decades ago, and over the subsequent three decades, the value of many well-located capital city properties around Australia quadrupled. And that underscored the wealth of many of today's baby boomers and created significant property empires for those who took property investment seriously. Interestingly, the current environment, today's environment, reminds me of those times 30 years ago. We're Working our way, well, we've actually worked our way out of the property market downturn of 2022, haven't we? And just like then, many of the arguments are being floated by commentators explaining why property values just can't keep increasing as they did over the previous three decades. Now, I accept much of the gains over those last three decades were related to some structural changes. They're not going to be repeated. Okay, two of the significant structural events that caused that massive rise in property values that supported the increase in wealth of a lot of baby boomers over the last decades were, well, the Reserve Bank's aim at keeping inflation under control meant interest rates just kept falling. I mean, the Reserve Bank's aim has always been, as we're hearing in the news all the time now, to keep inflation within a narrow band. And around that time, Back in the 1990s, banks became deregulated and allowed new non-bank lenders like Aussie John Simon, who started Aussie Home Loans, to make finance much cheaper, made it available to borrowers. And actually, over much of the ensuing three decades, credit became easier and interest rates fell. So one thing that led to increasing property values was finance was cheaper. And the other was that wages grew and there were a lot more two-income households. And this allowed many Australian families to buy new homes or upgrade their existing home. Now, those factors are not going to work on our markets moving forward. In fact, they played out a few years ago and they haven't been relevant for actually probably much of the last decade. Instead, today, the world's different. We're experiencing a volatile geopolitical situation around the world. Inflation's probably going to remain much higher for longer, longer than the Reserve Bank and most central banks would like. Yeah, we've passed the peak of inflation, but it's not going to get into that 2 or 3% band for some time. And well, look, we may still have another interest rate rise coming up, but then next year, eventually interest rates are going to start falling. Now, at the moment, they're at the sort of levels to slow the economy. A couple of years ago, they were at stimulatory levels, but we're not going to see stimulatory levels for a long, long time. The Reserve Bank's got to find that Goldilocks level, not too hot, not too cold, to help uh, just keep the economy chugging along. So 
I can see a number of reasons, some actually good reasons not to be fearful of the current market. So I started off by asking you, is it time to be greedy? Is it time to be fearful? Let's talk about why you shouldn't be too concerned. Firstly, the average Australian is still very wealthy. The average Australian's wealth is mainly in their homes and in their superannuation fund, and the overall residential property market in Australia is now worth close to $9.8 trillion, and there's only about $2.2 trillion worth of loans owing against all the residential real estate in Australia. And even though we've slowly spent that multi-billion dollar war chest we saved over the COVID, remember how we were saving when we were all locked away, many households still have significant savings in their offset accounts, and many have actually been prepaying their mortgages. And another reason the Australians are still in general, very wealthy. Now, I know some people are hurting, and I know some people are hurting because of higher interest rates, mortgage costs, but a lot of Australians have got uh, significant share portfolios and money in their self-managed super funds. So overall, Australia's wealth is, it's dropped a bit from the peak, but it's still pretty high. Okay. Now, again, we're talking about reasons not to be fearful of the current property markets. And while interest rates are have gone up. And yes, some people who borrowed at very low interest rates are now going to feel a squeeze as they come out of fixed rate loans, and those who even on variable loans are paying a lot more. There's no real evidence of mortgage stress for the majority of borrowers. Now, first of all, remember, half of all homeowners don't even have a mortgage. That's because they paid it off many years ago. And many other homeowners have maybe 20, 30, 40, 50% equity in their home because uh, they've paid off their loans slowly over the years. And even those who look back over the last three years, the, the value of their properties are worth 25, 30% more than they were before the beginning of COVID. Now, sure, there are some first home buyers who borrow to the hill to get in the property market. But as long as they keep their jobs, they'd rather eat magi noodles than sell up their homes and cause a property market crash. So, again, if we're looking at reasons not to be fearful at this time. I don't see real problems with mortgage stress. I'm not suggesting there aren't going to be some people who are going to be hurting and some people are going to have to sell off. Yes, uh, the higher cost of living, rising mortgage costs um, is going to affect some people, but the percentage of bank mortgages in arrears, which is the real test, is still very, very low. Okay, the third reason I'd suggest it's not a time to be fearful is the Despite high interest rates, we're still experiencing strong economic growth. Now, the Reserve Bank's trying to slow it down, and it will slow down over the balance of 2023 as higher interest rates and inflation weigh on consumer spending and this is weighs on business investment. I mean, after all, that's what the Reserve Bank wants, isn't it? However, the unemployment rate's expected to remain low. It'll creep up a little bit, but the low unemployment rate, the fact that people have got jobs, is going to support economic activity as will that half a million new Australian residents who came to Australia in the last year. And immigration is remaining very high, and they're going to spend up big establishing households in Australia. They don't bring all those things with them, so they've got to buy televisions and carpets and bed linen and beds, and all that's going to keep pushing up the economy. That's one of the reasons the Reserve Bank's having a bit of difficulty slowing down the economy. If we're looking at reasons not to be fearful at the moment, I believe unemployment, which is still at very, very low levels, is likely to remain low for years to come. And that's going to put upward pressure on wages, which means it's going to be easier for people to afford homes if they just have a little bit more money in their pocket. Currently, there's over 430,000 jobs advertised and just not enough people to fill them. So if people have jobs... Homeowners don't give up their homes if they've got a job. They just tighten their belts, as many Aussie households are currently doing. Now, way back in 1993, when we had that recession, or the years before that, when I talked about that at the beginning of this chat, unemployment was around 10%. That's why people had to give up their homes and the property market slowed down considerably. Another reason I'm not fearful at the moment, and I don't think you should be, is there's a shortage of supply of good properties for sale at a time when there's increasing strong demand. 
In fact, more properties are being purchased each month than new properties coming onto the market. And we have got the need for more accommodation, so we can't just keep buying established properties. We've got to build new houses, new apartments, and the construction industry is experiencing challenges. We know that still building costs are going up, supply constraints are still there, and the cost of building new accommodation, especially the new towers, is too expensive. Um, we're just not able to build enough to keep up with the growing demand for homes. And the imbalance between supply and demand has contributed to this steadying of house prices, now the increasing of house prices, and of course the increasing of rents. And as demand continues to outstrip supply, property prices, well, that can only go one way. I mean, supply and demand means that property values are going to keep going up. Rising construction costs, you know, particularly for those big high-rise towers, mean that many of the new developments currently on the drawing board, because we keep hearing that these uh, building approvals have gone up, but that doesn't mean they're actually going to come out of the ground because they're currently not financially viable. They won't start being built until values rise sufficiently to make new projects viable, and when the values do rise, and when they're able to sell these new apartments at higher values, that means the properties you and I own have gone, gone up in value as well. Again, as I work through reasons why I would not be concerned about, I would not be fearful in this market, because we talked about should you be greedy, should you be fearful, there's a shortage of rental properties, and that's not going to change. We're experiencing a rental crisis with historically low vacancy rates, skyrocketing rents, and no end in sight to that, partly because of the strong population growth. That's one of the other reasons that I believe that uh, we've got good times ahead for our property markets. Australia's population growth is booming, record high net overseas migration and a stable natural increase. We're still making babies and the Australian property clock shows that more than 26,600,000 people now call Australia home. The problem is our population is growing at around about 2% per annum, putting more pressure on demand for housing as more people need places to live. But our housing stock is increasing by probably about 1% per annum. In other words, we're not building enough to accommodate all these people, and Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane are going to be the main beneficiaries of this strong population growth because immigration is going to continue on. Our country's standard of living, our excellent health care, our quality of education make it an attractive destination for migrants, and the fact that they can get jobs here is making it attractive. And at the same time, our government's got a policy. It's their business plan to increase our population. They want to increase it by to about 30 million people by the end of this decade. And it is suggested that our population will double in 60 or 70 years. What it's taken us 220 years to get to is going to double in 60, 70 years. Can we do this? Well, I guess we're going to have to make quite some significant changes to our urban planning and our infrastructure, things I've discussed in this podcast with Ross Elliott and with Simon Kirstenmacher. But I guess what I'm suggesting is at the time when the media keeps telling you to be concerned, there's lots of reasons not to be fearful. Well, what about all those concerns? I guess they're coming from the same experts uh, who predicted a crash last year and the one before, uh, the multiple incorrect doomsday predictions over the last couple of years. And I think another factor that makes me comfortable about what's ahead is the increasing urbanisation of Australia. More and more people are moving to Australian cities, uh, moving from the regional areas, which is putting upward pressure on the demand for housing in these areas. And the trend's likely to continue. More people are wanting jobs, amenities and lifestyle that the city offers that the regional areas don't. The other thing is that there are fewer people in each household. It doesn't make a lot of difference, even though rather than uh, 2.5, 2.6 people in each household, we're going to probably only have 2.2 people in each household. That still means that we need about 160,000 more dwellings for the same number of people in Australia. So how we live in the demographics is going to drive the demand for accommodation. So in my mind, our property values are guaranteed to increase over the long term. I'm not suggesting there aren't headwinds ahead for our markets. I'm not suggesting there aren't going to be areas where property values are not going to do as well. But having been involved in property markets for around five decades, I'm a realist. 
I understand property cycles. I don't expect double-digit growth in property markets this year. However, I'm not after short-term gains. I'm a long-term investor, and I still see strong underlying fundamentals for our property markets. That's what I'll try to outline to you. While it's important to understand that many factors, including interest rates, supply and demand, market confidence, all those things affect property values in the short term. If you're a long-term investor, as I am, and you should be, prices are really affected by two main factors, population growth or household formation and the wealth of the nation. So population growth, as I said, Australia's got a business plan of growing our population to 30 million people by the end of this decade and about 40 million by the middle of the century. This means for every three houses currently in our suburbs, we're going to need one extra house to be built by then. Let me repeat that. If by the middle of the century we're going to have 40 million people from about 26 and a half, 26.6 million today, for every three houses, currently, we need one extra one. The other thing that's going to drive our property values in the long term is the wealth of the nation. We're a knowledge-based economy. Australians are going to be wealthier than many other countries and able to afford to pay for their houses in the long term. And this is positive news for the long-term growth of property values. The fact remains that as long as people are going to keep having children and residents from other countries are going to come to our shores, Australia's population is going to keep growing at a rate faster than almost every other developed country. And as I said, it's likely our population could double in 70 years' time. And a large part of this is going to, of course, come from immigration. And in general, they're from well-educated people, particularly from China and India. People are going to be in their 20s and 30s in family formation stage of their life. fact is, we're going to need whole cities of new immigrants to replace the 5 million or so baby boomers who are going to be leaving the workforce over the next 15 years. And these new residents are going to boost our country's economy, uh, I mean, because some people are saying, hey, let's just stop immigration. But because more baby boomers are moving out of the market, moving out of the job market, so retiring, and because the population of 85 years old and 85 year olds and uh, older is going to increase a lot over the next decade, we're going to need more people to look after them. And if you think about it, a lot of these people are going to be using the pension and the healthcare system somebody's got to pay for that. So that's one of the reasons the government wants more tax-paying working-class people. Uh, These new residents are just going to keep boosting the country's economy. Uh, They're going to be increasing revenue from income tax and from all the goods and services they buy, and that includes property. Of course, this means with more and more of us wanting to live in the same four big capital cities, particularly Melbourne and Sydney, the powerhouses of Australia, and Brisbane, the new world city of Australia. And many of them are going to want to live in the same suburbs in those capital cities. Our old friends, supply and demand, is going to just keep pushing up the value of well-located inner and middle ring suburban properties. Inevitably, I guess that's going to make property unaffordable for some. And I think moving forward, more people will remain tenants all their lives. However, others will be able to afford these higher-priced properties. It also means our cities are going to have to densify. The way we grew Australian cities um, by just spreading and spreading and low density, that was the way of the last century. This 21st century, we're going to have to densify, which means more apartments and more townhouses are going to be the style of accommodation that's going to be in strong demand from people who are going to swap their backyards for balconies and courtyards, Look, partly just because of the cost, uh, and, but also because of lifestyle choices. So they're trading space, you know, big backyards for place, being in the right location. And having learned the lessons from COVID, I think our neighbourhood's going to be more important than ever. Something people call the third place. You know, our first place is our home. The second place is the place of work or the office. But during COVID, for many people around Australia, the ability to get to the third place was taken away. Look, it could be their favourite cafe, a gym, a place of worship, just even the local shops and the local pub. Now, I remember it. Boy, I was in Melbourne where we were locked down for 260 days. A lot of us missed the feeling and connection to others and having an outlet to take a break from, from family or from the colleagues just to reset to get away. So that's what we call a 20-minute neighbourhood, where you've got the convenience of all these amenities a short 20 minutes away, uh, whether it's a short walk or a ride or a drive. Understanding these factors actually form 
a large part of the research data we use at Metropol to help future-proof our clients' investment properties. At Metropol, we're much more than bias agents. We have a very significant research department, and I think you've heard in various podcasts how demographics plays a big part in the research we do. And we always help our clients by starting off by putting a strategic plan together, recognising that the properties they eventually buy are the physical manifestation of a whole lot of decisions that have got to be made and made in the right order. So yes, we're much more than the bias agents. We have property management, bias agency, of course, uh, renovations, development, wealth advisory. So why not get the award-winning team? Hey, we won three international awards over the last little year. Why not get the award-winning team of Metropole on your side to help you through this maze of mixed messages about the property market? Go to metropole.com.au and have an obligation-free chat with my team. So, well, nothing's guaranteed in life if like me you're confident that australia has got a prosperous future and you agree that our population is going to keep increasing and that most of us are going to want to live in the same parts of our lucky country you can understand why i see a strong long-term future for our capital city property markets sure there's a risk in buying property but don't forget there's also a different risk in not getting into the property market to secure your financial future. Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. In today's mindset moment, I want to point out to you that to be successful, you're going to have to do the opposite of what almost everybody else is doing. To find success, sometimes you're going to have to Dismiss common beliefs. You're going to have to do the opposite of what most people are doing. Let's be honest. Most people don't get the success they deserve. I guess what I'm trying to say this time, though, is there are so many sayings we just take for granted it's true. You better look at them. You better look at them more closely because they make absolutely no sense. For example, statements like, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Well, what's the point of having a cake if you can't eat it? <laughs> you probably expected me to say that one, didn't you? Um, or what about this one? Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Well, if you think about it, isn't that exactly what the Trojans should have done? The point I'm trying to make here, maybe not so well, is that if you want to be a successful property investor or business person or entrepreneur, you're going to have to think differently to most other people. You're going to have to think differently to how they think. You're going to have to do things differently to what most people do. As I've written in my book, Rich Habits, Poor Habits, you're going to need to adopt rich habits, the habits of successful people, and you're going to have to give up poor habits, those that are shown by most unsuccessful people. And it will require deep programming of many of the common beliefs and assumptions that you've come to take as granted that you've come to take as true. Anyway, today I'd like to share two of these beliefs with you, suggesting that you let them go. And the first one is put all your eggs in one basket. Common wisdom seems to suggest you should diversify your investments. But but is that really correct? In my opinion, it's not. In fact, I remember reading Napoleon Hill's great book, Think and Grow Rich, many, many years ago, when he said that successful people specialize. They find one area that they're really good at, and they don't diversify. On the other hand, you'll find many financial planners tell you diversify. Why? Because if we put all your eggs in one basket and something happens, like dropping it, you're going to lose everything. But I've got a solution for that. Take good care of your basket. Warren Buffett said it well. Diversification is a protection against ignorance. It makes very little sense for those who know what they're doing. Robert Kiyosaki put it a different way. Many financial advisors recommend that you diversify for your own protection. What they fail to tell you is it's also for their protection, since most financial advisors can't tell you exactly what stock or managed funds is a great investment. They tell you to buy a bunch of them. They tell you to diversify. But as I said, in my mind, diversification leads to averageness. You know, bottom of the best and cream of the bottom. I found that wealthy people, successful people, be they a business person, entrepreneur, or investor, they've got one thing in common. They specialize. They all focus their concentration on one single earning activity. They eventually 
become exceptional at that one activity by continuously improving their skills, increasing their knowledge in that one activity. Despite the myth that's going around that it's good to have multiple streams of income, the wealthy very rarely engage in multiple earning activities. I remember one astute colleague of mine saying, if I try and do five things to earn money, I lose money in all five things, so I focus on doing one thing really well. So if you want to get rich, you've got to be great at something. And to be great at something, you've got to focus at doing that something. And that's where you put all of your eggs. Now, sure, in due course, you should diversify. Within property, you should diversify to different states or different types of property. I'm not saying that. I'm suggesting that businesses should have multiple streams of income eventually, but you've got to get to that point. Don't start off that way. So put all your eggs in one basket and look after it very, very carefully. The other myth I want to dispel in today's mindset session is always be on the lookout for new opportunities. Now, if you're like me, you're getting potential opportunities in your inbox every day. Opportunities like alternative investments, the next hotspot, the secret to success, the secret to untold wealth. I remember recently a client saying to me, Michael, I'm constantly coming across great opportunities. How do I choose which one to follow? In my mind, opportunities can be like obstacles if they take your focus away from what's in front of you right now. I've made more by saying no to perceived opportunities than by saying yes to them. I know it's exciting to chase the next shiny toy, but to become a successful property investor or successful at anything in business, in your profession, you've got to do the same thing over and over again. You only become an expert by doing one thing a hundred times rather than a hundred things once. How do you know when you're an expert? When you can consistently get the same result in any market. On the other hand, you lose time and focus when you entertain new ideas, research them, find out a bit more about them. Next thing you know, you're going, scattering all your focus, scattering your energy. So choose one area you want to specialize in. Maybe it's property investment, maybe it's renovations, maybe it's your profession, maybe it's your business. Remember, there are always going to be lots of opportunities in any field. Make sure you're doing well with one thing. Become an expert at it. Get rich first, and then you've got the luxury of pursuing other opportunities. So the bottom line is, if you want to become rich, if you want to become successful, do the opposite of what most people do. Well, thanks for spending the last little while with me, and I hope you got some benefit from this show. If you did, and you know somebody else who'd also benefit, please tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast. There's a share button on every podcast app. On Apple Podcasts, there's three little buttons down the bottom, press it and share it, or just tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast. I hope you're going to be doing them a favour, and you'll definitely be doing me a favour and helping me in my quest to make as many people as possible financially literate. Now, there's ways of catching up with me between these shows. Just look for Michael Yardney on social media, or why not join my private Facebook group? Go to Facebook and look for the Property Update Facebook group. And I have a way of saying thank you to you for subscribing to this podcast. Go to podcastbonus.com.au. There'll be a link in the show notes, podcastbonus.com.au, where you can get a bunch of ebooks and reports. My way of saying thank you. And when you've got time, why not listen to some of the old podcasts? There's individual lessons in each of those that I think would be helpful for you. I'll be back again real soon. In the meantime, have a great week. Make it a great week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney Podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. 
And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you? 